congrats, you just won the Mega Million Lottery. You decide <laughs> to treat yourself to a new vessel. If you're not really trying to revisit the whole network again, what do you buy? Narrow boat or wide beam? Combustion engine or battery? And if hybrid, series or parallel? What cool features would you spec it with? Okay, so I'm going to answer this for you. Okay. If we my, win the million Mega Millions Lottery, and what happens? Michael gives it away. I have to beg to, like, you know, help my family out, pay off the mortgage, whatever. Michael will just give it all away. Yeah, if there is ever a lottery win, if there is ever a windfall like that, it's, um, uh, she'll probably threaten me enough with divorce to, to... to I want to fund our basic travel, and I wouldn't do like luxury holidays, I would just do the travel that we've done before. Yeah, which is absolutely not the jet setting. Because I don't, uh, when you, I want to go and stay with the locals in the little, you know. Little places. Little inns or homestays. I don't want to stay in the luxury hotels. Like, I mean, I'm not going to lie. It would be nice for a couple of nights to have a rest, but it's not how I want to see the world. No, yeah, and and same here, and um, and also fundamentally, morally, I've got this whole thing of like um, lottery. No, it's all going away. So we um, might go to India and buy a tuk tuk to travel in or something like that, but it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be, like a you know a yacht or. No, you give me mega millions, and I'm going to have few thousands, mm -hmm. um, and a lot of other people are going to have some food. Mm -hmm. Um, but, you know, uh, if for some reason we did have to get a, a boat again, um, I'd probably still stick with an aeroboat. Wide beams are kind of attractive, but you just can't take them as many places. Um, and, uh, don't really get hybrid, uh, would, because you can't do kind of power recovery on a hybrid, uh, like you can in a car. Um, so I'd rather go with like full electric, um, because then you got the silence. But uh, and I don't necessarily want a shiny boat. Like no, I'd, I really don't want a shiny boat. I'd rather. I don't know. I like I like all the um, scars on our boat. Yeah, I like perseverance. I just uh, I could imagine, you know, if you were able to do a full battery um, electric, yeah, then the silence would be nice. Yeah, especially that's as true. I get older and deffer. Yeah. Um, number of times in the locks <laughs> we'll be talking to you. I can't hear you. <laughs> of course, number of times that's helpful. Um, number two, theoretically possible. Have you ever considered RV full timing in the US and Canada? Um, this is something my wife and I, I hope to do upon retirement. We've considered it. We have definitely considered it. Um, but not in a big RV. No, not in a big sort of um, a bus RV, like a big motorhome type thing. It would be. We did New Zealand in a Juicy. Yeah, it's pretty much a car, like an estate car. Yeah, uh, like a, a, I guess you just sort of call it a small family minivan in the States mm -hmm. um, that had been like properly kitted out as a thing you could sleep in and use. Um, but yeah, definitely not like the full big massive RVs. Um, not that there's anything wrong with those. I just, I wouldn't want to do it that way. I mm -hmm. wouldn't want to um, sort of see, especially America, RV park by RV park doesn't appeal to me as much as America campground to campground yeah. in something small. I learned a word, um, boondogging. Boondogging? Yeah. What's boondogging? Is it boondogging? I know boondoggle. I know various definitions of portions of these words. I don't know boondogging. Offhand. Google it in case I got it wrong. Okay. Uh, uh, Boondocking. Boondocking. <laughs> okay. Dispersed camping on public land. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Boondocking. Um, yeah. Boondogging. <laughs> sounds wrong. <laughs> and uh, is that a word? Uh, yes. Follow that nerd. Um, a wasteful or impractical project or activity often involving graft. No, I don't want to do that. Hmm. Oh, but if, if it's something you, you do plan on doing upon retirement, um, do it as early as possible. Mm -hmm. um, 
Uh, okay, so uh, you frequently listen, mention that you listen to podcasts. What sort of music streaming and YouTube content do you consume on Perseverance when you are in um, R and R mode? Um, What's R and R mode? Oh, rest and relaxation. <laughs> no, I know, but when, when do we have? Oh that? yeah, when do we have that? Yeah, fair <laughs> enough. Um, so, okay, I don't listen to music. Period. Um, that's a historical oddity about me. Um, it's been like 15 years since I've regularly listened to music. I do occasionally hear music and go, yes, I like that. Um, but like, for instance, I heard an Eminem song and was like, oh, it's a new Eminem song. And then I found out that it was like from 2013. Um, so yeah, I, um, I am generally always, me, listening to history podcasts or computing related podcasts or things related to um, like uh, m most of mine are kind of somewhere in those two. Yeah, you do have some like current affairs, like um, sciencey ones as well. Yeah, well, there's so I do a, there's podcasts and then there's YouTube. Um, YouTube is almost exclusively history now. There are some uh, science ones. Um, computer file when it comes out number file I like those um, but like I listen to a lot of the history guy um, there is a, there's one that I've been hearing a lot recently that I actually really like called not a pound for um, air to ground and it's they're just if if you're interested in fighter jets of the 1960s and onwards this guy does these amazingly well-researched videos that are are actually really kind of cool um, I also listen to one that's about, um, like, cooking things out of oh, history yeah. and stuff. Um, yeah. Um, oddly enough, our main consumption of podcasts that we listen to together is um, the, the, the True Dictator. Or no, Real Dictators. Real, Real Dictators. Mm -hmm. um, and they're, they also have a second one from the same group about um, D-Day. And um, and the history of D-Day and um, uh, those are brilliant because um, they're good content that we fall asleep to almost immediately. <laughs> um, there's just something about that guy's voice yeah. that is just like, oh, okay, I'm asleep. But then what? after listening to the same thing maybe thirty nights in a row, I'll stay awake and listen. And you'll and actually like, get to actually, hear. This it. is really good. But it's the same. It's the same. Like we know the same. Like the first five minutes off by heart. Yeah. And then eventually I'll listen to the whole thing through and be like, oh, so that's what Napoleon was up to. Mm. You know, yeah. Um, Do you want to know what I listen to or watch? Uh, well, I, I, I know one, mm -hmm. which is the um, um, uh, Shag Married Annoyed. Oh, yeah, I like that one. Yeah. I'm a bit bored of it now, but it, it is quite funny. Oh, and lots of true crime stuff in which <laughs> I start worrying about getting murdered. Watch a bit of true crime. And I like... Um, I like the indie projects and that kind of thing where people have got like a little hobby farm or uh, off grid place. Yeah, whenever you watch one of those and I catch it, I actually really like that. Mm, I mean, it's a lot of hard work and I don't want to stay in one place, but I just really like the idea of like having your animals and your vegetables and being a bit self sufficient. Oh, and recently I've found three others. Um, there's a, a, a hobby channel that just makes models um, called Boy Life Hobby Time. Um, there's a, two by the same guy, a mentor pilot, that are um, like description. They're meant to try and get you to not have a fear of flying. It's not worked. Um, because what they are is like a breakdown of exactly what went wrong and at the end of every video he's like see this is how the airline industry has improved over time and I'm like yeah they still get it wrong too often for me <laughs> uh, yeah but but yeah his videos are also really cool next one uh, Bob Bolton when are you going to do the Severn Crossing? I'm still up for it. Yes, Bob, thank you, um, you Bob's you, invited Michael to he's do invited the me a bunch of times and, and I keep falling through um, and and I, I wish I wouldn't. Um, we are planning on me tricking her into letting me do it on Perseverance. I've already said you can do it. Um, so the plan at the moment is um, winter, 
then into the Montgomery, then down to the Basingstoke to finish off the Silver Propeller Challenge. And on the way, it might we might not go the direct route. We might go via Sharp, sharpness. sharpness to Bristol. Yeah, the indirect but faster route. <laughs> um, yeah. So so definitely up for it. Um, and if we if we get update, we'll try and remember to let you know. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Because a lot of this comes down to um, the practical realities of why we're overwintering, where we're overwintering, and what yeah. we're trying to get done. Um, so. What is one piece of advice you would give someone who has taken the plunge to buy a narrow boat? One piece of advice I would give, just going back to when we first bought Perseverance, <laughs> be prepared for the learning curve and the budget you'll need <laughs> for that learning curve. Yeah. Um, Unless you get a brand new boat and you have the budget. <laughs> yeah. N nowadays, I guess I would also... Um, I keep coming back to the mental health aspects of, mm -hmm. of living on a narrow boat. There are so many good things about taking the plunge, as you say, getting onto a narrow boat, getting out onto the water, starting to see the system. Um, but there are a lot of threats to your brain um, in the physically getting concussed thing, which does happen. <laughs> um, and uh, and also in the t in the form of, of uh, like winter is harder than in a house. Mm -hmm. um, and, and getting medical care is impossible. <laughs> getting medical care is is uh, can be substantially difficult. So my piece of advice right now would be if you've taken the plunge to, to uh, move on to narrowboat. Um, you're you're if you're in the UK already and you're registered with a GP, the odds are you stay registered with that GP. Um, you can do temporary registrations, but it is more of a mess than you really want to know about. So um, establish that relationship. If you've got any kind of long-term issues, um, talk to that doctor. Let them know. Get them to understand this is what you're doing as a lifestyle and and be able and to keep that explain relationship. explain to them that there is no provision for people. None whatsoever for if you're outside. And, and there's there, there can be some uh, problematic issues. Um, yeah, so, so, you know, that would be my one piece of advice. Um, there are, there are other pieces of advices, like, like, you know, what Joe said, um, in terms of the budget, I would also say, um, invest in like, a uh, 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 um, Tiller? Yes. No, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, invest in a good tiller. But no, in, invest in a, uh, a training course in how to actually, um, oh, yeah. maneuver the boat well. I think that was a really good investment on our part in terms of it's paid off so well. Mm. Um, there is uh, a lot of times where we've seen people who are out on the waterways and they they clearly haven't gotten little tricks like we got on our class of just how to tie mooring lines better. How to moor up. How to moor up. Um, how to spring how, off and on. How to sit mooring, still. How to yeah. Th there was just lots of stuff that um, that we got out of that. Yeah, um, rope management. Uh, yeah, um, and and yes, definitely like managing the lines and tying up correctly um, <laughs> saves you so much trouble. Yeah. And uh, and saves and, and and often when we get yelled at by somebody who's like you're going too fast, it's like no, we're not. You really haven't got your lines tied up. You see the lines drooping in the water. Yeah, and you're shifting back and forth because you haven't figured out how to keep your boat connected to the. Anyway, land. that was three things, and they yeah. also one. So. <laughs> yeah, sorry, kept going. Um, Louise Spanks, do you feel isolated being continuous cruisers, or do you feel you're part of a wider canal community? Definitely Both. feel like part of the wider canal community, but also isolated. <laughs> yeah, um, those are those are not mutually exclusive. <laughs> yeah. Um, there is, uh, yeah, they're really not mutually exclusive. Uh, continuous cruising, like part of it's YouTube, but also part of it's just meeting people. Yeah, like like you build up a lot of you uh, pull up community. You pull up at a mooring and you speak to your neighbour. Like that doesn't happen you know, in everyday life. No, yeah, so there is definitely that. There is a community and the boating community is great and yet you don't have kind of continuous contact with anybody. Yeah, it's always new people. I mean, sometimes 
Which Sometimes you see somebody you've again. seen a long time ago, mm. um, and and so there is, you know, but but like, but yeah, they're just not mutually exclusive to each mm. other. Like, um, there is definitely isolation in being a continuous cruiser. Um, when we were living on a mooring, we had regular conversations with the people on either side of us, and you know, um, it engaged on talks about hobbies and all that sort mm. of thing. And, and the sort of conversations you don't get in transient mm -hmm. meetings uh, just moving around the canals. But, yeah, there's kind of nowhere I don't feel like if we needed help, we couldn't find yeah. it. Because that's the beauty of what people do with the boating yeah, community is, like is they we, tend to want to help out. Yeah, we try and help others as well. It's, yeah, it's really we very cool. rarely meet anybody who isn't, you know, kind of... Happen. understanding it does happen yes <laughs> but it's it's relatively rare compared to the the um you know oh i'm having this problem oh i've got the right tool you know yeah, that yeah. sort of thing and and yeah so you definitely feel like you're part of it uh karen santiano mm -hmm. uh perseverance had a blacking done and you've done wonders with the interior but are you considering a paint job for the outside that process would be interesting yes it would be interesting um <laughs> yeah it's if we had the money we'd pay someone to do it yeah doing it ourselves it's not complicated but it's just dirty and tiring and we and there's a lot to consider in terms of needing to have a like if you want to do it right you've got to um take it back to the metal like if you really want to do it right so you get the longest life out of the thing you've got to take it back to the metal and you've got to you know do all the prep work and everything and that is you also need to keep it dry while you're doing that so you need to rent either a poly tunnel or a dry dock somewhere um and then there's the question of you know like spraying versus painting with a brush and laying it on that way and everything um i i would love to give percy a a makeover uh, and and do the outside thing and really well. Hopefully, it will happen at some point. But but the the price of doing it, we we can't afford it. And you know, um, fifteen to twenty thousand is sort of reasonable to pay somebody at the low end to do it well. Mm, do it really well. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I mean, and and the problem is is that doing it badly. Like, not badly, but doing it cheaply isn't worth it. Because if we just kind of scrape up what's out there and paint over it, that'll peel off. Mm -hmm. um, if if you take it all the way back and, you and you know, we, we have to take all of that stuff off the roof that's... Um, yeah, all the hardware. Uh, yeah, um, it, it's, a, it's a big job. It's yeah. a very interesting big job that um, I would absolutely pay somebody else to do if I had the money. We don't have the headspace to do it ourselves right now. Not at the moment, no. But, um, but yes, it would be interesting to see it done. Um, Jim Negus, which of the current canal restorations due to reopen in the near future are you most <laughs> looking forward to exploring? Uh, in the current climate, I find it remarkable so many miles are being added to the network. I also find it remarkable. Especially as the ones that are here are falling to bits. Uh, yeah. Um, there there are issues uh, in places, but I'm very glad people are trying to yeah. um, open new ones, and I'm very glad that people are fighting to try and keep the existing ones in water. The reality is, I don't think we'll be on the water long enough to see them. Yeah. I don't think... But we might I, be. I mean, we are definitely going down to see the bit that we opened in the Montgomery. Um, I, I have a feeling that just on time frames, it's unlikely that there's going to be anything else that happens within mm. the amount of time we plan on remaining in the UK on a boat. Mm. Um, you, know, you never know. Yeah, we never know, and we, we still have never made up our minds as to what we do with Perseverance while we're out of the UK, not on a boat. So, yeah. you know, do we keep her in a marina? Yeah, because it because nice we do love her so much, and would be nice to have a home base to come back to, yeah. or do we cash out? Uh, Philip Harris, what are your top memorable moments from your time on the move since Cambridge? Um, Getting stuck below uh, 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 a locked lock. <laughs> memorable moments. Okay, so I've got two, and one's memorable for a good reason, one's memorable for a bad reason. Okay, what are these two? The, and what did I do? <laughs> the good one is. 
um, the magic of you and me standing on the sandbank in the wash. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was amazing. Actually like, getting onto the sand and running around and seeing George just wiggling and... It's hard to explain how wonderful that is until you're doing it in the sunshine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That that really is one of those, like, oh my God, this is one of the things that makes a life worthwhile. And um, the bad one... So yeah, in York, a couple of weeks ago, the vlog hasn't come out yet. Um, we had about a week in York and it was lovely, but where the moorings are, outside the park, there's just this concrete... Um, platform? Platform with some steps going up to the park. And I took George out just before we went to bed and the water had come up and it was almost splashing over the concrete. And I was like, Michael, the water's come up. And you were like, it's fine, it's fine. So then we, we got into bed and then we were looking at the... Um, the website which says the water levels and it was predicted to raise like a meter overnight which would have put us up over the concrete yeah the boat would have, would have real problem the boat would have raised up i mean the, the the lines would have had to be loosened the boat would have raised up and it could have floated the con across the concrete so <laughs> at 10 o'clock at night i ran through york oh and we that night as well which we we never do this but we'd run out of water <laughs> so that night we had to pull the boat in the flooding water down to the water points, fill it up while I ran down to see um, a mooring a little bit further down which had a higher platform. And then my, my guy had I'm, the... I'm filling it up with water and watching the water <laughs> come up over the concrete, so that was a bit strange. And then Michael had to bring the boat down through two bridges in the dark whilst being blinded by a oh, pub slide. Oh, slug and lettuce. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what it is, like a disco ball or something, but there's this bright blue light coming out of the slug and lettuce, uh, which is a, a restaurant chain pub thing. Here. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, with a with a bizarre name, um, but it's just in the right position to utterly dazzle me, so I cannot see where the is actual it? bridge um, and the uh, stanchions are, and I'm just like, well, this this could get real bad. I mean, the water wasn't flowing at a dangerous speed but it was dark and everything felt sketchy and yeah we had George and it was yeah, yeah. it was Wednesday night so it's student night so there's all these like kids, kids in fancy dress like on their freshers week it was and then you're 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 on the land on the the mooring area you can't see the sign that, that says I'd, you, been, yeah. I'd been like, I'd been like, you just look for the blue sign. Well, I didn't realize it's underwater at this point. I was like, um, Michael, there's no blue sign. Here. <laughs> so then I'm trying to make it. I'm trying to make it through this arch, and yeah, she on, says, you know, if you, uh, I'm here and I'm waving a light, and I'm like, because I had, there's like a dot. I had like, the head torch and I was like flashing it. Yeah, there's like this tiny little red dot and a tiny little white dot and this great big blue thing. And I'm like, and I have no on, idea where I'm going. Mike was on the radio going, I can't see the bridge stanchions. And I'm like, oh, God. And I just see the, the nav lights and the headlight coming towards yeah. me. And we didn't vlog a thing because it was no, too stressful. I, I wish we'd I wish we had some recording of that. Because well, that I was, put the I put the GoPro on the front, so we'll have that. But Yeah, yeah. but we, um, we were just too... Man, that, that was see, actually scary. Like coming... I, I mean, I, I couldn't tell you about... Um, the, the flow on the river was actually substantial and, and I'm heading towards that bridge and mm. I really could not tell I knew I knew that there's a gap I know that there's three I know that the one on the left I absolutely can't go through mm. I know that the one on the right I absolutely it's can't like go through it's like head for the middle and hope I have to head for the middle but I cannot see it and I'm moving towards it without any ability to, to meaningfully stop and mooring up was okay because you turned around and came back against the flow and we're well practiced at that so that was fine but yeah sure enough the next morning water had come up a meter yeah so yeah. And, and it was really important that we make that move and we were a few inches away from it actually going over where we moored then so memorable <laughs> memorable moment that was definitely memorable yeah i mean for me the memorable yes would definitely be um on the on the sand with george that was amazing and I would say my sort of other memorable moments are um, the times you've gone down into denial because we're turning into a lock <laughs> and each of the times it's been a not 
scary turn. <laughs> no, apparently I did a better turn on the Calder and Hebel, or a harder did. turn on the Calder and Hebel than yeah. turning into the lock. Yeah. So. It was just funny because both times it's like, you know, you're down there going like, are we okay? And I'm like, yeah, this is really nothing. <laughs> this one is nothing. <laughs> um, there have been times when it hasn't been nothing. This is a nothing. Um, okay. Uh, Amy Alice Tilson. How many silver propeller locations have you done now? Plans for more? Favorite silver propeller location? Thanks. Um, ah, and, and uh, uh, apparently IWA is part of your life. Um, I think we've done 43. Yeah, that's the number you keep coming up with is 43. Because we haven't done the vlog yet. Um, we did the River Force in York, finally. Yes, um, which was good fun. And there is... So we've been to the Silver Purple location on the Montgomery, but the Montgomery has now been extended. And we've been to what was the end of navigation at the time on the um, Basingstoke. Due to a landslide. Due to a landslip. Although we didn't know about the Silver Propeller at the time. No, and it was before the Silver Propeller was even a thing, so. So we don't think that one counts. So we're going to go back to those two and that will take our total to 44 and that will be all of the Silver Propeller locations on the integrated network. Yeah. Obviously there's the ones not on the integrated network and Scotland. Scotland, yeah, it's not on the integrated network. Yeah, really not on the integrated network. <laughs> and we kind of have this idea of doing them in our RV with our um, kayak, but again it's not high on our wish list of things to do not yet not at the moment um i i would love to do more of them um you know if if anybody feels it's, like again it's the infinite budget because we don't yeah. have a camper van and we no yeah it's it's that thing of of um of not via lottery but um but if if some other means there was the camper van then maybe um the favorite silver propeller locations um hmm hmm uh, hmm. Yeah, that one's tricky because it's like, which were your favorite? Um, I, like, I really like doing the River D in Chester. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's like favorite. Well, it was challenging. The River Foss was that was good fun. But that I think is because it's my most recent. Also, and also because it was one that we missed and then we went back to. Yeah, but that was a good feeling. Um, a lot of them, it's the journey to get to them. Yeah, uh, like it really is the sort of struggle to get there. It's not so much what you find yeah. in most of those locations. Um, there's just the fact that you've gone you've, that little extra And mile. you've seen some good things on the way. Yeah. Um, so like the River Foss was fun, but going to York was great. So, Like I would say that the, the Pocklington. Oh yeah, that was beautiful. Was, was absolutely beautiful. Um, totally worth pushing up there to do it. Even worth falling into the canal. <laughs> um, I can't think of all of them. I mean, a lot of them were just sort of incidental. Like, they were places where we were going anyway. Yeah. The, the Pockington, to me, was one that, that was was really notably worth the push. Yeah. Um, you know, same with the, the, um, the River Weaver um, yeah. one. Turned out to be something that was worth the extra bit of effort. Um, there's, you know, I'm, I'm glad we went to all of them. I'm really glad we, we went to some of the more obscure ones. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, like, uh, doing all the little branches on the river ooze. Uh, yeah. The great ooze and everything. They were that all was, worth it. Yeah. And, and they were. Although I think only Brandon the Silver Propeller. Well, that was on the Silver Propeller, but there's also one down at the end I think Bedford Bedford mm -hmm. um, yeah they, they, yeah the grey twos is stunning so it was worth going to Br Bedford to see everything else along same the way same like the middle level navigations like some of those oh, some, stretches some were, were a bit boring <laughs> well they were a bit boring but they were worth the stretch you know it's just it yeah, it's, the like, ju it's the journey it's, it's not definitely the, the journey it's not, it's not, the, not the destination the, not the destination <laughs> but um, but the IWA has done a really good job of selecting places yeah. that are not hard to visit. Some of them, some of them, like um, some of them are impossible. Like, full disclosure: I went a lot further on the River Foss than was necessary to get the silver <laughs> propeller. Um, but uh, some of those locations that have been chosen are not hard to get to, but they take a little bit of planning and they take a little yeah, bit of effort. And like the on the Foss, we spoke to the guy Noel, um, 
who unlocked the lock for us. And, you know, I was saying, do many people do this? And he pretty much said that everyone that did it was doing the silver propeller. And I think that's great. Like, yeah. it proves that it's working. Yeah. And, and I'm glad that navigations, like, I wish there were ones that are currently technically reality is they're disconnected. Mm. And I wish they weren't. Um, the River Weaver. Um, yeah, down no, not through. the River Weaver. Sorry, well, you know, the, the Weaver the, down through Run Runcorn. Um, oh. Oh, no. The re no, it's not the Weaver. No, I'm thinking the Welland and the Glen. Mm. Those are those are truly disconnected, and they shouldn't be. They should definitely shouldn't they, be. They, they are navigable, um, at least. And the that's Welland. that's what I worry about. Like, the loss know, of it. Well, like where we are now, the Huddersfield. Every time we've done it, it's got harder and harder. Mm -hmm. And at some point, it's going to be impossible, and then it's going to be too late. And that's just one example of things that are happening all over the network. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and the, and and same with like the River Derwent. Um, yeah, there's a section you could that go you further. could go further, but you, no, can't you can't go further. And and um, um, likewise, like the the um, the old Bedford. Yeah, in my mind, just as a piece of history, that's one that mm -hmm. was it. You know. It's a navigation. It's been a navigation for a long time. It was made a, a drain of navigation and is used by the EA right now. And they, they kind of make the argument that it's like for fish stock. But it's like that was an artificial cut. It, no natural fish stock exists there. Yeah, um, what I'm... fish exist there are it, to try and turn that into a fishery is kind of nuts. Um, because it is still legally required to be open for navigation. And until you get an act of parliament, but it's, it's like, also where they tried to prove that the world was flat and they failed. But it's like, uh oh, it's, you know, the lock's fallen into disrepair and then, you know, give it five years and yeah. there's no turning back. And it, and it needs, you know, it needs effort to keep it there and the silver propeller helps bring attention to that. Mm. But that's one of the ones that's kind of effectively impossible at the mm. moment. And it, and shouldn't. it shouldn't be, it definitely shouldn't be.